Last New Year's Eve, I made a resolution to change my life for good. After years of buying dog sweaters, I'm going to crochet 24 dog sweaters in 2024. And it's not gonna be like last year when I resolved to read 365 books in 365 days, or the year before when I wanted to high five every person I passed on the street, or the year before when I decided to stop making unachievable New Year's resolutions. No, this time I'm actually gonna do it. If you're a big New Year's resolutioner like me, you've probably thought a lot about goals, what they mean, how to set them, and maybe most critically, how to follow through on them. And sustainability experts are asking themselves those same questions all the time. From poverty to climate change, we're facing a whole laundry list of challenges that threaten humanity and our environment. And just like sorting through my towering mountain of yarn, we'll need some serious planning and follow through to get to the other side. Jokes aside, whether it's keeping your dog fashionable and snug or ending poverty and reversing climate change, if we want to see progress, we have to figure out how to make, keep, and achieve our goals. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. If you've ever abandoned a New Year's resolution, or like all of them, you might have noticed that setting goals is a lot easier than achieving them. And that's why New Year's resolutions are relevant to sustainability, because people love to set sustainability goals. In this episode, we'll be talking about specific goals that exist right now in 2024. But it's important to remember that our goals can change. For example, when I was four, I wanted to be an astronaut dragon tamer librarian when I grew up. Instead, I became a climate scientist PhD candidate, which is just as cool. It is. And even if we do stick with the same goals, achieving them isn't always easy. Just like getting my dog sweaters done means I might have to multitask, or at least spend less time watching dog sweater videos on TikTok, changing the world for the better comes with trade-offs. And that can make reaching our goals difficult, especially when they come into conflict with other goals and ambitions. Like in 2015, 195 parties signed the Paris Agreement. They pledged to pursue efforts to stop the average global temperatures from rising more than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, ideally closer to 1.5 degrees. Putting a cap on global warming would limit the extent and intensity of its negative impacts and help protect our social and environmental systems. But now it's 2024 and that 1.5 degree goal, it's looking more and more like toast. Burnt toast. Temperatures, emissions, and fossil fuel production are still rising, and most of the more powerful countries that signed the deal aren't holding up their end of the bargain. Because the measures these countries have to take to align with the Paris Agreement, mainly reducing their use of fossil fuels, rub some other goals the wrong way. Like, lots of countries really value their gross domestic product, or GDP. That's a dollar amount that represents how much the goods and services produced by a country were worth in a given year. And most countries' goal is to grow their GDP as much as they can, all the time. But while growing GDP might be a great sign for the economy, it's a terrible way to tell how we're doing when it comes to sustainability. Like the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill off the coast of Alaska was, without question, bad for the environment. But because of all the money they had to spend to clean it up, it actually increased Alaska's GDP. So if we're serious about reducing emissions and making the world a more sustainable, healthy, just place, many countries either need to ditch their GDP goals or find different ways of growing their economies. That's a trade-off where an improvement in one aspect of lifestyle or well-being brings along a decline in some other aspect. So what would it look like to do something different? Let's take a trip to a small Himalayan country between India and Tibet, Bhutan. Beginning in the early 1970s, Bhutan's government started using Buddhist principles to measure progress through its Gross National Happiness Index. Their goal is to have happy citizens, which means providing a safe and stable environment where people are physically, mentally, and spiritually healthy. So Bhutan collects data about how happy people are based on four pillars. Good governance, sustainable socioeconomic development, preservation and promotion of culture, and environmental conservation. And officials use that data to create new kinds of goals, ones that place well-being at the top of their priority list. Now, just to be clear, the GNH hasn't solved everything for Bhutan, but figuring out how to value things like happiness, security, and general well-being allows us to make new kinds of goals, ones that can address all three of our dimensions of sustainability. The economy, sure, but also the environment and human societies. Take the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. This was a set of eight global goals established in 2000, and they shot pretty high. They aim to reduce child mortality by two-thirds, cut the number of people experiencing extreme poverty and hunger in half, reduce biodiversity loss, increase access to education, drinking water and prenatal care, and more, all by 2015. As you might guess, we didn't quite meet all those targets in the end. But we did meet some of them. The numbers of people living in extreme poverty dropped by more than half, the gender disparity in education was hugely reduced, and we majorly decreased cases of malaria and tuberculosis. And those goals helped set the stage for a whole new host of targets for the future. Some of the most important of those new targets are the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. In the early 2010s, they were developed by a group of political and environmental leaders brought together by the United Nations. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals built on the Millennium Development Goals to emphasize connected social issues like hunger and 
in poverty as well as environmental challenges. They describe themselves as a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. They were formally adopted in 2015, and the intent is to achieve them by 2030. But how do we know how well we're doing? Well, any New Year's life coach will tell you that when you make a resolution, it's important to have ways to see if you're on track. Like if you're trying to crochet 24 dog sweaters in 2024, you might use an app or a notebook to make sure you finished at least two in January, which I totally did, I swear. The same idea is true with sustainability, and different groups measure your progress at different levels. On a global level, Our World and Data is one organization that tracks SDG progress. For example, Sustainable Development Goal 1 focuses on the human society side of sustainability. It says we should work to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. To track it, Our World and Data looks at things like how many people live in extreme poverty and how many have access to basic services like school and medical care. Meanwhile, on a national level, Sweden implemented a National Plastic Action Plan in 2022 in response to SDG 14, which is about conserving and sustainably using ocean, seas, and marine resources. Sweden's plan includes specific targets like limiting plastic bag consumption to 40 per person per year by 2025 and having a 50% reduction in the litter of single-use plastic packaging by 2030. Right now, in 2024, the SDGs provide a framework for the whole world to work towards sustainability, and its goals give global and national governments a jumping off point for realistic, meaningful action. But sustainability works at the local level too. And even if they're not specifically working from the SDGs, city and community governments around the world are busy making their own goals for a sustainable future. Take what's happening in Tempe, Arizona, home of our good friends, Arizona State University. Like many places in Arizona, Tempe is hot, and not just because it's in the Sonoran Desert. Tempe also suffers from the urban heat island effect, where the cement, concrete, and asphalt that make up cities absorb heat from the sun. This makes the city hotter during the day, less able to cool off at night, and generally less comfortable than its rural surroundings. In 2022, Tempe residents endured 84 days with temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And projections show it's just gonna get worse. So the city created a climate action plan Plan, a set of goals and strategies based on its citizens' biggest sustainability concerns. Turns out, lots of people in Tempe are concerned about the heat. So one of the big points in the Climate Action Plan is to mitigate the extreme heat its residents experience. But while it would be great to just cool the place off somehow, reducing heat isn't a super actionable goal. The way climate change is going, nobody can single-handedly stop the desert from getting hotter. So instead, they broke that big goal down into smaller, actionable plans to make the city more resilient to the heat it's likely to face. Like plans to create more shade by planting trees and building shading structures, and use building materials that absorb less heat to protect the city from the urban heat island effect. And they're creating resilience hubs, where residents, especially the most vulnerable ones like very young or elderly people and people living in poverty, can take shelter, cool off, and find resources during extreme heat events or power outages. Tempe's Climate Action Plan is still pretty new. The first version of it only came out in 2019 and was updated in 2022, so we don't really know yet how successful it'll be in the long run. But listening to their citizens' concerns helped officials create goals that work towards sustainability and improve people's lives. And making realistic, actionable goals has hopefully set them on a path toward real, lasting change. So that's the global, national, and local levels for us. But now let's zoom into a very, very local level. How do I fit into all of this? If I'm not running a government or a multinational megacorporation or even a city sustainability office, what am I supposed to do with all these goals and ideas? Sure, I can crochet all those dog sweaters if I really want to, but when we're talking about big global problems like climate change and poverty, do my personal sustainability goals matter at all? Just like four-year-old me didn't have the power to make myself into an astronaut dragon tamer librarian, most of us don't have all that much power to solve our big global problems. We don't all have the same environmental impact. The top 10% of global income earners create around 25 to 43% of the environmental impact whereas the bottom 10% of earners create just 3 to 5%. But don't lose hope yet, because it's also true that individuals do matter when it comes to sustainability. For example, let's talk about recycling, a great way to reduce waste, lower your carbon footprint, and contribute to a more sustainable world. Sometimes. Look, we all learned about it in elementary school. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Recycling is great. It takes 95% more energy to manufacture new aluminum than it does to recycle aluminum. And aluminum is infinitely recyclable. So if everybody recycled all their aluminum cans, we could majorly reduce the amount of energy it takes to make new aluminum products. Not to mention keeping your five daily LaCroix cans out of the nearby landfill. But here's what they don't tell you in first grade. There's a dark side to recycling too, and your individual effort also matters there, a lot. Wish cycling is a word people use to mean recycling items we wish were recyclable, but actually aren't. Coffee cups, greasy pizza boxes, your half-eaten yogurt cups, most kinds of plastic, and tons of other waste products seem like they should be recyclable. But putting those things in with your recycling actually does more harm than good. Unrecyclable items create way more work at recycling facilities, and they can also contaminate actual recyclables and cause them to get thrown away. So wish likely creates more waste than there would have been in the first place. 
So recycling responsibly makes a big difference. By getting familiar with your local recycling policies and knowing what you can and can't recycle, you can save not only your recyclables, but tons of other ones from the landfill. And if you're really invested, you can tell your friends or make signs or speak at public events or on YouTube to make sure lots of people know how to recycle responsibly too. And then all of a sudden, you've got a movement on your hands. Responsible recycling is just one example of how your own goals and actions really can make a difference. Sustainability goals can seem big and lofty, but achieving them starts with small, measurable actions, exactly the kind of thing an individual person can do. Even though real sustainability can seem as far-fetched as me becoming an astronaut dragon tamer librarian, setting measurable, achievable goals along the way gives us specific things to work toward, and a better chance of reaching our big goals in the end. Goals turn big ideas into specific actions. On levels big and small, there's something we can all take part in. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, share your New Year's goals in the comments, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.